Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Six Keys for Effective Evangelism. You know, we all face barriers when it comes to sharing our faith, whether it's the first time you've, you've ever shared the gospel or whether you're a seasoned evangelist. Um, you're going to benefit from today's webinar. Dr. Larry Moyer, after 48 years of uh, being a professional evangelist, uh, has gathered tips, keys, tactics, and sharing with others how to share their faith more effectively. I'm going to share those with you uh, today. And I think you're getting a lot of benefit out of it. But in addition to barriers that we face, uh, the Lord has also often placed uh, somebody or multiple somebodies uh, on our heart and mind that we know need to hear the gospel, whether it's a coworker or a friend or a neighbor. And I just want to challenge you as we as we go through today's content, uh, as Dr. Moyer is going through these keys and you're thinking of that individual, maybe ask yourself, you know, which one of these keys is going to help me, could help me to maybe open that next conversation with this individual or uh, push me closer to sharing the gospel with them. And I think that's going to help you get the most out of our time together. We have a co-presenter today. It's uh, David Souther, who's the president uh, of Avantel, evangelist in his own right. And I uh, just think that today's going to be a great webinar uh, for moving uh, down the line. And definitely as we move into 2021 as a New Year's resolution to be more effective uh, at evangelism. And so with that, I want to move to today's agenda. Uh, we'll first talk about what, what evangelism means. Uh, everybody has an idea of what evangelism is, but we want to look at, you know, what's the biblical understanding of evangelism? Uh, we're going to get right into six keys uh, for being more effective at evangelism, have a concluding thought, and then have a time for a Q&A like we always do. And so with that, I want to jump right into uh, today's discussion. Uh, first off, just talking about what is evangelism? I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Larry Moore. Well, evangelism means a ton of things, a lot of different people in different churches. And one reason we have to talk about what is evangelism is hard to talk about increasing our effectiveness in something if we don't know what that something is. Now, let me begin by saying that evangelism is not being the poor or helping the hungry. Now, please understand, those things are absolutely essential because they build credibility, develop rapport, give us people who will listen to us. But that's actually should be called free evangelism. Evangelism actually come from a Greek word, eungelizo, that means to announce good news. And one place that's used in Luke 2, verse 10, 11, where the angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David's Savior, who is Christ the the Lord. Now, wherever that good news is announced, there's always intention. There's always a desire to persuade. So I think evangelism, biblically defined, is sharing the gospel with the intent of seeing the person trust Christ. Now, we know from 1 Corinthians 15, gospel can be defined in 10 words. Christ died for sins and rose from the dead. We know from the gospel of John, that God's asking people to believe, to trust in Christ alone to save them. So evangelism, biblically defined, is sharing the gospel with the intent of seeing the person trust Christ. In other words, it's both information and invitation. It's information, the gospel, is invitation, will you trust Christ? And biblically defined, it's sharing the gospel with the intent of seeing the person trust Christ. And keep those two things in mind, information, invitation, is so helpful. Because we inform them, but do not invite them, you're really not evangelize them. At the same time, if you invite them, but don't inform them what it's all about, you will not evangelize them. Evangelism is information invitation, sharing the gospel with the intent of seeing the person trust Christ. Now, it needs to be mentioned that whether or not they trust Christ does not determine whether or not they've been evangelized. In other words, if I share Christ with the husband, tell him Christ died from a rose and he needs to trust Christ and he does, I'll evangelize him. If I share Christ with his wife and tell her Christ died from a rose and you need to trust Christ, but she did not trust Christ, she has still been evangelized. In other words, when you inform them and invite them, you've evangelized them, whether or not they actually trust Christ. Well, understanding evangelism is one of the most important things in increasing effectiveness because the increase your effectiveness in anything have to know what anything is that you're increasing your effectiveness about. And so having an idea of mind informing and inviting them is so important. Now, with that in mind, 
let's talk about six keys for effective evangelism. Six keys that will help you be more effective in both informing them and inviting them to trust Christ. Now, actually, we could probably discuss 16 or maybe 26. But at the same time, there are six I would say are absolutely essential. And the one I'd like to begin with is one that's so basically important. And that is, you got to surround yourself with unbelievers. Winston Churchill was noted for his comment, we need the genius to recognize the obvious. Now, the reason I mention that is, a doctor cannot treat a sick person if he does not know anyone who's sick. Contractor cannot build a house for somebody if he does not know someone needs a house built. Mechanic cannot fix a car if he does not know someone needs a car fixed. At the same time, a Christian cannot save a Christian. In other words, the one thing no Christian can do is lead another Christian to Christ because they're already Christian. You can only save the saved, can't, you can only save the non Christian, you can't save the Christian. And so that means you've got to surround yourself with those who know unbelievers. Often I hear people say, I'm going to be more evangelistic. At the same time, though, they're not around anyone who really needs Christ. And so you guys surround yourself with unbelievers. Otherwise, you can't have personal evangelism without personal contact. Um, and you have to look at how many unbelievers do I know. Now, I would suggest to make that even more pertinent. Ask yourself two very important questions. And that is, how many contacts do I have with unbelievers on a weekly basis who need to hear the good news? I say weekly because I mean on a regular basis. Not one you see every other week. Not one you see every other year. But one you see about once a week or every other week. It's got to be on a regular basis. And would people be tempted to call me the same thing they call Jesus, a friend of sinners? I love that comment, Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, that Christ was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners, of tax collectors and sinners. What better comment is there be made about any of us than saying he's a friend of sinners? And so you ought to ask yourself how many contacts you have on a regular basis, and would people be tempted to call you a friend of sinners? Because you got to surround yourself with unbelievers. Now, with that said, those contacts will probably come from three sources. They come from your work, from your leisure time, your neighborhood. Now, to use my own example, being in full-time evangelism, I do a lot of flying, and I've found that airplanes and buses and taxis are great opportunities to evangelize because I spend a lot of time there and have people I meet who are unbelievers. When it comes to leisure time, I really enjoy the outdoors. My favorite sport is hunting, and I hunt with nine Christians all the time as recently as last week and that gives me opportunity to talk to them about christ then the other source is my own neighborhood because i live around unsafe people i don't know of anyone who lives in neighborhood that they're all believers even if some of them are there's some who are non-christians and so you ought to ask yourself who do i know from my work my leisure time my neighborhood that i could invite talk to about christ and for that reason, I offer a challenge for 2021, and that is how balanced, notice the word balanced, are you, between contacts with believers and unbelievers? What do you think needs to change? Sometimes people say to me, I don't really know any non Christians. And so I always like to challenge that. I say, in other words, the grocery store you go to only have believers. Well, no. The hardware store you like the best. There's no unbeliever there, right? And they start realizing they do know non Christians. They're just not doing anything with them. And so you got to look at your contact with non Christians. And the key is balance. You need to be around believers, but you also need to be around unbelievers. And the key is balance. Larry, that, that's such a, that's just a huge point because I think many, many of us find ourselves, if we're not careful, surrounding ourselves with non-christians i mean with christians we uh you know i i know some people who contact our offices say i'm just surrounded by believers i don't have opportunities because uh for some reason um the people i come in contact with are believers i just don't have any non-believers and larry you know your, your point is well taken 
I have found personally that prayer is huge in, in kind of getting out of your comfort zone and, and getting to the point where you can have non-believers in your life. And, and I would say it's, it's a three, for me, it's a threefold. It's first of all, Lord, help me to see the contacts that are around me with non-Christians that I'm overlooking. In other words, open my eyes to the opportunity. Second would be, Lord, bring people into my life, those divine appointments that need to hear the gospel. And then third is, Lord, you know, I've got my life, I've got my routine. Where are the new places that I need to go in order to be around non-believers? So I think that I just want your, your opinion to this threefold prayer. Open my eyes to the opportunities around me, bring new people into my life, and then finally lead me to new places if that's your will for me can help bring those opportunities with non-believers. Yes, and I think the reason that works, David, is that God is a whole lot more concerned about laws than we even have thought of being. And therefore, when we get serious with God, he gets serious with us. And we'll answer prayer in those three areas. And part of what we'll be getting into next is that some of that will mean replacing opportunities with believers with unbelievers. Because there's something we're doing that could just as easily be done with non-believers. And that's why the key number two is, and I say I keep saying each of these you could spend a lot more time on, take time for non-Christians. In other words, if you have contact with non-Christians, that's great. But you got to be realistic and realize knowing non-Christians is not enough. They need more than your friendship. They need your time. I often have people say, this takes no time at all. And I love to tease and say, so it's already done. They say, what do you mean? I said, well, you said it takes no time at all. So it's already done. The fact is, any single thing we do for nothing takes time. I don't care if it's two minutes. It's that two hours. It still takes time. So if you decide I'm going to cook a meal for an nutrition, I'm going to help them with a home project, I'm going to run an errand for them, I'm going to have a backyard conversation just across the fence. I'm going to loan them a car and I'll get a ride to work. I might send them an email or a note to encourage them. Or speaking of the COVID crisis, I might pick up their grocery for them so they don't have to be out because they're in that particular category where they're very vulnerable. Every single one of those takes time. So no non-Christian is not enough. You got to take considerable time. And are you only spending time and seeing believers? That's why, as we said earlier, David, there are some things time-wise that you could easily be doing with non-Christians instead of Christians. Now, one thing I keep emphasizing is you will never have time. Uh, I've not met people that are really productive that time. The issue is taking time. I'll have to use the analogy of why do we eat three meals a day? Because we feel that's important. We don't always have the time to, but we take the time because we feel that's important. At the same time, you got to take time that means rearrange your schedule to have time for unbelievers. So you take time because busyness, because how it impacts time, can be a killer to evangelism. Well, Larry, that's so true. And, and one, one thing that that brings to mind for me is uh, to, be, to be careful to build margin into my day. Because I find, Larry, that some of the most fruitful evangelistic opportunities that I have are those that I didn't plan for, are those that just happen on the fly. And, but but here's, here's a pitfall I fall into from time to time. When I set out my day and I get my schedule and I'm going, and then there's an interruption, sometimes, Larry, the frustration I feel in the interruption, because my day is not going how I thought, um, can keep me from recognizing the divine opportunity that's before me. In other words, the interruption that maybe God has sent for me to talk to this person has interrupted my day. And I have to make sure that my mindset that I'm flexible in being able to recognize those opportunities and then have the margin to take time to take advantage of the opportunities so I fulfill God's mission for me at that moment. Well, what makes that a little bit humorous, David, years ago, one time I read of a person who said to a pastor, well, you really stepped my toes this morning. 
He said, I apologize, I was aiming for your heart. <laughs> and the matter is, you're speaking of heart because to be transparent, years ago, someone said to me in leadership, you don't allow enough time for the unexpected. Mm. And one thing I had to learn in leadership, you have to allow time for the unexpected because things come up in leadership that you were not expecting. The same thing with sharing Christ, things come up that you're not expecting. The other thing is, as you know me well, David, I'm a very organized person. Mm -hmm. I've said things want to get done. And again, being transparent for years, if something interrupted that schedule, it became frustrating, but now I couldn't get it all done. I found sometimes those interruptions were God interruptions. Mm -hmm. They were God interrupting my schedule for good reason. And so if I simply moved what I thought had to be done to another day, it solved my problem mm -hmm. and solved my frustration. Because sometimes you got to allow for the unexpected, like you're saying, and also, there are people God's going to bring across your path you did not know uh, that moving what he had thought had to be done to another day could be very important because today God wants you to spend time with this unbeliever. Amen. And that's all part of the way God works. In fact, when you look back, you see how exciting it is that sometimes God interrupted your schedule and something out of it was so much more eternal than something temporal that you were about to do. Absolutely, Larry. That's great. So well, we got the first two principles, and I know that that principle three is, is going to be huge for a lot of people. Yes, and that is be intentional about dealing with excuses. Don't excuse them. In other words, don't excuse excuses. I think excuses are characterized by two things. They're subtle and they're satanic. And the reason I say they're subtle and satanic is because sometimes we don't even realize how much they're impacting us. And that's why we say be intentional because you go in with intentionality, look at excuses that you may not face realistically enough or holding you back. Now, to put a little meat to that, I could talk about three. Some people say, well, I don't feel motivated. Well, I love Hebrews 416, come boldly to the throne of grace, be by my mercy and grace in time of need. So some people say, I don't feel motivated, and I have real apathy in that area. Well, God is not going to lambast us over the head if we say, Lord, I really don't care for non-Christians. I really don't care where they spend eternity. Take away that apathy. He says, come hold it to an You might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And so therefore, take God's word say, God, I don't like my apathy. I'm going to have to replace that with concern. Now, some people say, but I don't enjoy being around non Christians. Well, Matthew 9 36 always interested me because it says he would fill with compassion because they were sheep without a shepherd. God never asked you to enjoy them. God said, Do you have compassion for them? Any believer who living for Christ ought to be more exciting to be around than a non Christian. I have the gift of evangelism, and so frankly, I enjoy being around non Christians probably more than most do. At the same time, if you said to me, Are believers more exciting for you to be around than non Christians? Any committed believer who really walked with Christ ought to be more exciting to be around than a non Christian. But at the same time, God doesn't ask you to enjoy them. God said he had compassion for them. And the eight times New Testament it says he was filled with compassion. Don't excuse that excuse, excuse. Look at it with intentionality. Then sometimes people use the excuse, well, they're probably not interested. Now my answer to that is, how could you possibly know if you don't ask? Because God might be preparing them for your conversation. Sometimes, unfortunately, I find the reason people say that is they're watching the news too much. And someone said to me one time, you mentioned people that are approachable. I'm surprised you say that because, boy, when I listen to the news, I don't get that. And I said to them, the people in the news are not the normal person. The normal person drives to work wondering if he'll have a job next week, if his wife might be, or husband might be diagnosed with cancer, with all kinds of difficulties within the family. That is a normal person. And you don't know if they're interested unless you ask them. There are one time I was speaking to somebody that I just met. And I thought, they don't strike me as somebody to be interested. I thought, I'm not going to let that govern me. They might be. 
I turned that conversation to social things and found they were very approachable. And I tell people, don't read people wrong and don't let excuse hold you back. Big point we're making there is, don't excuse your excuses because we have excuses that can be subtle, it can be satanic. And in a way we're not even recognize, you might be holding us back. And if we have the contact, we have the time, but we don't deal with excuses. We probably won't go much further in increasing our effectiveness. Right, that's so powerful. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the really the first two excuses you brought up about motivation and enjoying non-Christians. And again, just getting back to the practicality of prayer. If you seriously do not feel motivated to pray and ask your good heavenly Father above to give you that motivation, if you do not enjoy non-Christians, for you to simply go to, to, to Father God and say, Lord, help me. Give me the motivation that I need, that your son had, that I need to have. Um, I can think of a, a sermon I heard early in my Christian walk, Larry, where the pastor addressed people in the audience who just were so stricken by fear, they were not willing to go and show their faith. And he asked this question, Larry. He said, are you willing to be made willing? And if you're willing to be made willing, are you willing to ask God to make you willing? And, and Larry, God answers those type of prayers. Have you seen that in your life? Very much so. If God can change the heart of non Christian and bring the Christ, can God change the heart of a Christian and bring him close to the lost? Well, of course he can, because God has no limitations. And again, be willing to be willing is a, be, is a key factor. Absolutely. Now, key number four, with that in mind, master the know-how of leading someone to Christ. Now, why do we mention that? Because that's for you. You can have contacts and take the time. You can deal with excuses. But now, if you don't know how to lead someone from point A to point B, how are you going to get them there? And that means know-how can hinder us in two ways. First of all, it can make us unsure how to do the gospel. In other words, we're not sure how to explain to them what they need to know. And also, it can make us unsure how to close the conversation and invite them to come to Christ. Well, remember, we said evangelism is information and invitation. Therefore, you gotta know how to explain three things in non Christian that we are sinners, Christ died for us and rose again, we have to trust Christ. Because that encompasses the gospel and encompasses what God asked them to do, trust Christ. And therefore, you have to know how you're going to explain that to them. You have examples to use. For each, for practical sinners, Christ died for rose again, trust in Christ, and a few Bible verses to support each one. So they know you're talking about what God said, not simply what you say. Now, I really emphasize a few Bible verses because you don't want to overwhelm them with your Bible knowledge. You just want to need a few verses to support what you're saying, but you have to have that know how. Now, many are helped. By Van Tell's bad news, good news approach, and explain the gospel. I've had people say one of the best things you ever did for us would teach us the bad news, good news. I think one of the reasons they like it is not only can people identify with it, anyone in the world can identify with bad news, good news, but it's very easy to remember when you're right there face to face with an unbeliever. I found in traveling and God and kindness I don't deserve, I often mention, has allowed me to speak in so many places, but I've not met anyone. With the meth evangelism, who did not have a meth evangelism that saw their effectiveness increase. Now, one thing in increasing your effectiveness is you got to have a method. And different people have said, since I mastered the bad news, good news, I talked to more people than I've ever talked to before. I sincerely do not know in 48 years how many people have said those exact words to me. Since I mastered the bad news, good news, I talked to more people than I ever before because of a method. Now, people say, well, even if I have a method, you know, I know how to do it, but I'm just not good at persuading people. Well, I tell them, remember method used for presenting, not persuading. The method is not the persuader. God is the persuader. Judge 644, we often use here to Van Tell, no one can come to me, that's the Father who sent me, draws him. And you're simply called to present the gospel, only God can persuade him. And therefore, when we say information, invitation, your intent is to see them trust Christ. 
whether or not they do is not your responsibility. You still evangelize them, but you don't have to take the pressure to persuade them. You bring Christ to them. God has persuaded them by bringing them to Christ. Yeah, Larry, such an important point. And, and really, the, this fourth um, key uh, about know how can actually tie into another excuse that people have because sometimes we, you know, when we have the opportunity to share, well, we talk ourselves out of it because we think, man, I'm not as good as Larry Moyer. I'm not as good as a Greg Laurie. I'm not as good as Billy Graham at explaining this. They are much more qualified than me. Therefore, they should do it. Or, Larry, it, it, it's, you know, I have this opportunity, but I really need this person to talk to my pastor. who's And they miss the opportunity, and they don't realize that perhaps they were in a better position to talk to this person than their pastor because of the trust that they already have with this person, but they back away from it thinking they need to be an expert. Yes, and by so doing, they're giving in to another kind of excuse, like you mentioned. Mm. And also, ones like myself have found that sometimes persuading people is so simple as asking them. If you simply ask them, anything keeps you from trusting Christ right now? Mm. Sometimes the comment people make is, no, I've just never understood it before. And one reason people like myself or the ones you mentioned persuade people is they found through experience. Sometimes all I have to do is ask and they learned that through experience. Mm -hmm. And through experience, they simply learned how to persuade people. You know, I also think of the person out there who may have the excuse, hey, I'm just not a sales type person. I'm not an extrovert. I'm not good at chit chat or talking. I don't feel like I'm really the person to do this. Can you address that person, Larry? Yes, because there again, I wanna go back to God in prayer. I often tell people, you're talking to the person, but you talk to God at the same time. The exciting thing about evangelism is I can talk to two people at the same time, God and the non Christian. I talk to God through my heart. I talk to the non Christian through my lips. And so as I'm talking to the non Christian, I can say, God, give me wisdom. Give me boldness. Help me to know how to do that. I myself, David, have been in a situation just recently, I think of one, where I wasn't sure how to go around a comment a person made. And there in the whisper of my heart, I said, God, help me know how to turn that comment around. Right there, a thought came to me. I honestly did not have 15 seconds earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that's where you talk to God and ask him for that ability. Now, again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of experience because people who do evangelism well do it often mm -hmm. because there's so much you have to learn simply through experience that will be taught to you as, as you act in obedience. And you know, Larry, just summarizing this fourth principle of master the know-how, this is why Vantel exists. This is why we want to be a resource for people all over the world, pastors, um, uh, church attenders, members, people in the workplace, and give them the resources they need and the know-how they need to go and do this. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do. So thinking of these four, Larry, and moving into number five, I'm looking at number five here and I'm thinking, hey, this really is the heart of why we have excuses in the first place. Yes, because you have the contacts, you can take the time, you can deal with your excuses, you got the know-how, but there's something that's still going to raise his ugly head and that's called fear. And I've not met one person who's transparent, God not face it. So just because you have the contacts, just because you've got the time, because you don't excuse, you have the know-how, does not eliminate fear. It's therefore, the fifth key is you have to resolve to overcome fear, not allow fear to overcome you. One, two people is going to be the winner, either you or fear. You can overcome it or it can overcome you. Now, again, I can't size enough. Fear is something everyone, including evangelists, face. It would face the New Testament. In Acts 4, verses 29 and 31, they have the first persecution recorded in the book of Acts. And they said, Lord, grant your service boldness that they may speak your word. Because they were afraid. They'd just been persecuted. First persecution recorded in the book of Acts. Two verses later it says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were prayed were shaken, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. That God answered boldness. And just like with all things you go to God prayer about, 
you say, God, give me boldness. I one time talked to someone that was a bit cold and callous in his comments, a bit loud spoken, I was a little bit concerned what would happen with our conversation. And there I said, God, give me boldness. And as I was shying away from the conversation, I felt desire to approach him because God answered boldness. I think something that's not mentioned enough often is that a perfectionist evangelism does not come when we move forward without fear, we we'll move forward in spite of fear. In other words, those who evangelize don't do it without fear. They're often very much afraid. They do it in spite of fear. And that's why I have to resolve to overcome fear and not allow that fear to overcome you. Because fear is going to be very real, very present. Wherever boldness occurs in the New Testament, it all occurs in the opt in against the optical of fear. Because often, you have nothing to be afraid of, you don't need boldness. But you need boldness because there are things to be afraid of. You're not sure what's going to happen. Some people are afraid they can't answer objections, might lose a friend, all kinds of things. But you got to resolve, I will not let fear be dominant. Instead, I will dominate fear by God's grace. And resolve to overcome fear, not allow fear to overcome you. Hmm. That's a huge point, Larry. And, and so basically what you're saying is um, we're always going to have to deal with the fear. The question is, are we willing to move forward in faith despite the fear? Exactly. Um, building on that, Larry, um, man, from my point of view, evangelism is a great way to build your faith. Because when you are willing to say, all right, God, I'm going to take your word for it. I have these fears, but I'm going to overcome my fear and step out in obedience. Larry, it's just like working out in a gym builds your muscles. Stepping out in faith and evangelism will build spiritual muscles, draw you closer to God in dependence, and um, help you mature in Christ. And so I think a lot of times we overlook the fact that evangelism is one of the best discipleship tools personally that we have in our repertoire. Sometimes when you're out there and when you're being to this next and you're really being obedient, you experience the power and the strength of God and it's a great you need it better than you ever had before. And that's why it brought you closer to him. I use analogy sometimes, um, and bear with me because I'll tie it in. The Moody was one time asked, do you have the grace to die? He said, no, but when it comes time to die, I have the grace. God always gives grace when you need it. When you're in a management situation and you need grace, you need strength, mm -hmm. you access it, and that's where it goes back to your discipleship. All of a sudden, you experience something in discipleship you did not experience before because now is when you needed it. Yeah, exactly. And then that just builds your faith for future opportunities. Larry, these five points are solid, but getting into the last one, number six, I'm looking at number six now and I'm thinking, yeah, this is really where a lot of those fears come from. This is the source. Yes. And the key number six would be expect satanic opposition. Or you got to expect it because of the fact you're going to have it. Now, why? Pursuing evangelism, you're making a front line attack against Satan. You know, uh, he may be disturbed that you're going to pray more than you used to. He may be disturbed you're going to read the Bible more than you used to. But when you evangelize, you're making a direct attack, decreasing God's kingdom, decreasing uh, Satan's kingdom. Increasing God's kingdom. That's a direct attack against Satan. And that's why you're going to experience his opposition. And one reason Paul said to the Corinthians, don't be ignorant of his devices. Don't be naive and think this is not going to happen. Because I have seen believers in churches that decide to be evangelistic, that really experience satanic opposition. Being in it for so long, I get invitation to be a plenary speaker at pastors' conferences and everything, such as leadership conferences, I often tell church leaders, if you're not experiencing satanic opposition, you're not doing anything in evangelism. Because if you want to see Satan upset, see him direct attacked against you, just do something in evangelism. And that's why you ought to ask yourself, if I were the devil, how would I hinder my witness? Then whatever you decide on, be prepared for his attack. In other words, if you think he could use sexual temptation, you better prepare for it. If you see he could use materialism, you better prepare for it. 
you ought to make a list of what you think in your personal life Satan could use to hinder your witness. And whatever he does, work against that. Because Satan will do everything he can to hinder the message and the messenger. People, if nothing else works, I have found his primary tool will always be discouragement. In fact, it's interesting. I found something, David, that if so, I'd be more evangelistic than I used to be. Many times, the first person they meet is one of the most antagonistic, hardened, callous, and cold person they ever talked to. And Satan uses that as a way of saying, well, good luck. That's what they're all like. So good luck. And the fact of the matter is, that's simply satanic because he's trying to oppose you and think this is not going to work. You ought to give it up. Now, bear in mind when we talk about satanic opposition, though, whatever we do, I encourage people, don't walk around in fear, in faith. I love 1 John 4.4, 4, and keep it front and center in your life. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. In Christ, you are the victor. You are not the victim. And therefore, you say, get thee behind me, Satan, because greater is he is in me than he is in the world. But I'd be dishonest, I'd be unwise if I didn't say to you, he got to expect satanic opposition. Because you are now making a direct attack against his kingdom. Uh, Larry, just off the top of your head, two or three practical things our listeners can do and things that you have done in the past um, to combat Satan um, in this battle. Well, first of all, is being aware. Being aware is one of the biggest things that you got to be recognized. Just be aware it's going to happen. Secondly, say, God, as I go forward, help me not to be hindered by whatever Satan does, because there are times you experience direct satanic opposition. I was on an ATV recently with a, 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 a four passenger ATV, and I had a great chance to talk to two people. And the wife was already a believer, and I thought, this is so exciting, because here we are in the middle of the outdoors. It's going to be such a great opportunity. I've been praying for a chance to talk to this woman's husband. I thought, man, what an opportunity. Just then, another ATV came along, and all of a sudden, the conversation was out the door because, and I'm convinced that was satanic opposition <laughs> because that ATV could not have that, had to come along at that time, but it did. By the same token, I was speaking to a man in a restaurant one time. We were having a great conversation. I was whispering to God, help me turn this, and he did. And we had to start again the great conversation. Just then, his phone rang. I said, if you have to take that, understand. He said, I really do. And he took it. And he said, that is a weird thing. I said, why? He said, that person never calls me. And why do you have to call now? And I'm convinced it's satanic that I don't think you can sit and look at those and say, well, those are coincidences. I think Satan will try to attack them any way he can and hinder the gospel. I think two of the most important things is be aware of it and go out in prayer saying, God, work against anything he does. Now, in those conversations I just relate to them, I was able to do some things, but they still were hindered by what Satan did. Mm. Well, Larry, these are all excellent. And, you know, we want to get our uh, listeners involved here. So we got a poll question for everyone. The poll question is this, of these six keys, which key would you like to improve on? Another way of looking at it is which one of these things do you struggle with the most? Uh, surrounding yourself with non-believers and, and, or making the time for them or intentionally dealing with excuses? Uh, could it be mastering the know-how of leading others to Christ? Resolving to overcome fear or finally expecting and dealing with satanic opposition? Still looking at the results coming in and we have a winner. Sure enough, number one, surrounding yourself with and taking time with non-believers. Um, boy, that's the, that's the number one issue, Larry, and it's a good thing that was your very first point that you addressed right off the bat, is the issue of making sure we haven't insulated ourselves uh, from people who desperately need to hear the gospel. Yes, when you, I often tell people, reflect upon your own conversion. Think about the time the person led you to Christ. What if they had not spent time with you what if they would have given in their excuses? Mm. What if they had not learned how to share Christ? What if they did not overcome their fear? They didn't know how you were going to respond. 
what if they would have given in to Satan's tactics? You probably may not be where you are now. Now, God could have used anyone. Of course, I recognize that. But you think of your own conversion and say, I thank God he spent time with me. I thank God he or she did not give him the excuses. I thank God he knew how to explain to me. I thank God he did not give in to fear. I thank God that Satan did not win. Mm. And reflect your own conversion helps can give you a greater desire to in terms of your own witness. Mm. That's good, Larry. Well, Larry, just we're getting ready to uh, take questions here momentarily. But Larry, as only you can do, can you give us one thought that if you want any, if you want our listeners to take away one thought from this uh, webinar, what would that be? Well, I would say, if I were to put in two words, start now. In other words, becoming more effective does not have to be a New Year's resolution, does have to be a next month resolution. Some people say, boy, next month I'm going to change that. No, true obedience does, well, I'll not wait till tomorrow. So therefore, why not start right now? And true obedience does not procrastinate or question. The first thing Christ ever taught disciples was evangelism. Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Then the first thing he taught about evangelism was Luke 5, let down the net for catch. And they said, we tore all night and caught nothing. But at thy word, I let down the net. They didn't say, but tomorrow we'll let down the net. They didn't say, but next week we'll let down the net. At thy word, I'll let down the net. In other words, start now. So if you want to increase your effectiveness in evangelism, I would not ask, what are you doing to increase your effectiveness in evangelism? I would ask, what are you doing today to increase your effectiveness in evangelism? Because it all now week till tomorrow, an individual one time made the comment, Satan does not care what you do to evangelism as long as you don't do it today. Well, that's a pretty good comment. You know, as long as you keep putting it off, that's all he cares about. And the point is, start now. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till the first of the month. Don't wait till next week. Start now. Excellent, Larry. Well, um, we want to open it up for uh questions and answers now. And so um, if you have a question, anything related to evangelism, please go ahead. If we uh, can't get to it in the webinar, we'll try to send you the answer. But Larry, leading this off, uh, someone has a question here about additional tips for introverts. What if you're the type of person that you struggle with small talk, you, you struggle to uh, to, to, to meet new people and feel like, you know, uh, you can converse with them. Any tips, Larry, practical tips for this person who asked, and several others may who have not asked about being an evangelist as an introvert? Uh, two things I would say, take baby steps mm. and set a goal. Now, by that I mean, I talked to a person one time who was such an introvert. I mean, probably the most introvert person I've ever seen in my life. And I challenge him, I want you every single week to say something to a stranger that you never met. Thank you for your service. You know, where do you live? Every single week, I want you to say something to one person to start with baby steps. And I think you have to take baby steps. I think you have to set a goal and then be serious about it. Sometimes that's where even having an accountability partner comes in can be very helpful. Say, no, what are you doing in light of your goal to make sure you reach it? And what you find is this, I use an analogy. I let a person to Christ who had a terrible time looking at you in the face when they were talking. They always looked down the table. Mm -hmm. and I said to them, I want to make you, I want you to promise me you always look me in the eye. When he first did it, he felt so uncomfortable with it because he wrote it down the table. I said, I'm not going to look at the table. You got to look at me. Or else I walk around the door and he talked to me. And he was a good friend. Mm. When he first did it, it felt so awkward. Then he became very comfortable with it. Well, if you take baby steps to the goal, you'll find out it was as hard as I thought it was. You get yourself out of your comfort zone mm. to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. That's good. In other words, if you say, I'm going to be a public speaker, well, that's not going to happen. But if you take baby steps, who knows, one day you might be a public speaker. Mm -hmm. So first baby step. Yeah. First baby step would be set a goal that aligns with 
you're introverting this. In other words, okay. I'm going to talk to one stranger every day. Gotcha. Or I'm going to talk Good. to one stranger every other day. Good. But you got to have a realistic goal uh, that that gets you out of something that you don't usually do. It's not in your comfort zone. and get you out of the comfort zone. We've got another listener, another question here, Larry, and, and they've made the point that we could probably have a whole webinar about how to build margin into your day. Larry, do you have a couple more practical tips for people on how to build margin for time into their day so that they would have time if the opportunity presented itself to share the gospel? Yes. One thing that's helped me tremendously is take a list. Of which I keep a list of everything I want to get done for a day, carry it in my pocket. I take it from my calendar to my pocket, it's just my system. I take a look at that day, and then I say two things about that schedule. Have I allowed for the unexpected? And secondly, can any of this be moved to another day if that day is too full? The issue is not having too little on your schedule, it's having too much. And if you take your schedule and look at it on a given day and say, does this even allow for the unexpected? If it doesn't, deal with it now, not tomorrow. Deal with it before mm. the day starts, mm. not after the day starts. Mm. And secondly, then say, could any of this, this looks pretty crowded, could any of this be moved to the next day? Now, you know what's exciting, David? If when tomorrow comes, I find out, you know, I really could have done that today. Mm. I can always move it back on my schedule, but it's easier to move something back on your schedule than it is moving out of your schedule if you're not planning for it. Yeah, so planning is the key. Yeah, planning is the key. Absolutely. Um, planning before something happens. Another question, Larry, um, and this one kind of makes me chuckle, but it's huge, is, you know, how do you practically practice your method prior to um, actually sharing it with a non-Christian? Larry, I know you're so well-versed in various methods, including bad news, good news. This may not even be an issue for you these days, but for someone new getting into this, how, what is the best way to practice? One of the best ways is to find somebody, a fellow believer, brother, sister in Christ, and say, I'm learning how to evangelize. Could I practice with you? I realize you're already a believer, but could I just share this with you and get your comments? Mm. That can be very helpful. I know the Huber story, David, a true story, though, that someone did that with her sister. And she said, I would like to, I'm learning how to evangelize. Could I share this with you? And the sister came to Christ because she said, I've never understood this before. Can I trust Christ? And the sister actually came to the Lord that she was practicing on. And she, it's not that she did not know she was not a Christian, but she opened these spiritual things. So she thought, can I explain this to you? That see if you understand it. And she found out her sister was even more ready than she thought she was. Wow. But I think practicing with someone else. And then once you've done that, again, you can't. Believer cannot be another believer to Christ. Once you've done that, then go and get out of your comfort zone and share Christ with somebody somewhere. Now, will that be your best presentation? No. The 150 people from now will be your best one because they think I learned my experience. But if you don't start somewhere, you won't start. Mm. The person made the comment, it's not where you're at, it's the direction which you're headed. If someone is not great at their gospel presentation, but at the same time they're learning how to do it, I've got this tremendous respect for it. Mm. Uh, and I keep saying those who do it often do it the best because okay. you got to learn by experience. Okay, good enough, Larry. Got another question. And boy, is this question ever relevant for, for our day and age now? The question is uh, this person is retired. When they were working, they used to. Uh, they used to be around a lot of non-Christians, but now that they're retired, coupled with the fact that we have COVID and, and we're quarantining, they just don't have as many opportunities, anywhere near as many opportunities as they used to. What advice do you have for them? And, and this goes across the board because we all have to admit our, our exposure to anyone, Christian or non, has been diminished in the last nine months. Yes. One thing I say is don't beat yourself up. COVID has unfortunately hindered our opportunities. I've got a friend who has a gift of evangelism and he's going through a very difficult time because he's retired. He used to visit prisons and nursing homes, everything. Now they won't let him in. And so you got to be realistic and don't beat yourself up over that. 
Secondly, you can still keep praying for non Christians that you know, because God has other ways to bring to Christ. And besides, with COVID over, you might have more opportunities. Then, another thing I would mention is don't forget the power of an email, a letter, etc. Because you can even write something to someone and say, you know, I wish I had time to talk with you. I realize though, with COVID, we can't get together right now. But I want to share something with you. It would have made a difference in my life. And even though you cannot meet with them physically, cannot say does not mean you cannot communicate with them. Yeah. Communication doesn't limit itself to face to face. It can be to a letter, email, some retirees or gray emails. If you're not a letter, anything, a note, a card. And the other thing I was doing all this is don't forsake the time now to build bridges that will give opportunity later. Mm -hmm. In other words, I might only be able to take groceries by their house. Yes. But that could build a bridge to being in their house five months from now. Yeah. So don't waste the time. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, volunteering comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, even if you're a retired volunteering, and I know there's some organizations out there now that if you can't go and be physical with, physically uh, present with someone, as a volunteer, there's a lot of online opportunities for volunteering as well, where you interact with people. Yes, absolutely. All right, Larry, here's a question. And, and this is kind of a personal question for you. What is the number one fear Larry Moyer has these days in evangelism? How do you deal with it? And can you give us a real life story about you overcoming that particular fear? Uh, yes, the number one fear I'm a person who gets along with people, very accommodating, easy to get along with. I love people. Uh, they respond well to me. Uh, the number one fear is unpleasantness. That, in other words, when I bring up the subject mm. or turn to spiritual things, they may get very upset with me because they've got preconceived ideas. If they find out I'm a preacher, that may help it, that may hinder it. It depends where they're coming from. And now I take the unpleasantness, the unknown, how they're going to respond, mm. et cetera. Um, uh, and to give you an example, one time I'm thinking of a person right now I start to talk to, I found out they had a very bad experience. They made it clear for me, I hope you're not about to talk to me about spiritual things because mm. I've got no time for that. They must have heard of your reputation. <laughs> yeah, they must have. <laughs> and so, I said to them, well, I'm sorry about that. Could I ask one question? Why don't you have time for it? Could I ask what happened? Mm -hmm. Because I don't step religion down anybody's throat. And I often have said it to them. I don't step religion down anybody's throat. First of all, I'm not talking about religion. And secondly, that's not my approach. Mm. But I'm very excited about something that's made a difference to me. I'd love to share it. But if you tell me not to, I won't. And I think you've got to be very upfront, transparent, uh, come through the front door. I call it the front door for mm -hmm. non believers and be come through the front door. And it turned out we had a pretty good conversation with this person I'm talking about. But I would say it's so much it's just the unpleasantness of it mm -hmm. because I love pleasant conversations. And even if people don't agree with me, I love being able to talk with those who disagree. Mm -hmm. But when you get an unpleasantness attitude, that can really hinder you. Now, again, People say, what helps you? It's finding out there's very few that I get. Because the more people I talk to, I find out they're very approachable. Mm. And so I use the analogy often that I may get two out of 10 that I want to talk. But when you get eight out of 10 to do, which one's prominent in your mind? It's the eight, not the two. Yeah. And I like that strategy, Larry, that you used in dealing with the unpleasant list to try to get the root to get to the root of why they feel that way. Yes. Yeah. And if, if they if they find out that they can be honest with you without you cutting them off right away. Or being defensive. Or being defensive. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, being defensive, not being defensive is such a key that they can tell you anything they want to tell you. That would be a big help, uh, be, be a big help to you. Okay, we got time for one more question here. Uh, got about a minute left. Larry, what's the most effective way to pray for a non-Christian? I think one of the most effective ways to pray for them 
is that God will give what the Bible calls an opportunity for the gospel. That, you know, with the opportunity comes receptiveness, ability to listen, etc. But the first thing when I think of somebody, I pray God give an opportunity to someone to talk with them. Because unless someone has the opportunity, uh, now, obviously, that talks about evangelism. When it comes to that person himself, and I'm praying God open his heart to the gospel. Mm. Uh, so the opportunities on my part, openness of his heart is their part. Absolutely. So I usually combine those two things in prayer. God, give opportunity and cause person to be open. Mm. And I tell people, if someone's not open today, don't read that wrong because they could be open tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I've seen people change overnight because if all of a sudden I'm diagnosed with cancer, et cetera, all of a sudden I might be open where I wasn't before. Yeah. Well, Larry, thank you so much for taking the time during this holiday season. And we just want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And, and we pray, you know, as a staff that God, you listeners, God will give you opportunities in the very near future, if not in the very next hour to apply what you learned. Thanks, Larry. Brock, we're going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, just like uh, David said, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we do have uh, an offer going with this, with this webinar, especially uh, for those uh, who are just interested in learning how to present proper truth to those um, who you have the opportunity to share with. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that people who know a little bit about Christianity or who have been kind of in and out of churches, they kind of hear things like God helps those who help themselves, or, you know, I have to know the date uh, that I was saved in order to truly be saved and things like this, that God never said, never in scripture, but people just believe them. And, and so this is a great resource, 21 things God never said. We're offering it for 20% off. Uh, if you go, if you type in this uh, URL down here, uh, vantel.org slash webinar dash offer. And when you go to check out, you'll have the opportunity to put in a code. And if you put in 21 things, all caps, uh, it'll take 21, 20% uh, 20 off the, uh, the purchase price. And a great resource either for yourself or from someone that, that you know uh, that could either be helped by this themselves or helped with having conversations with others. So please take advantage of this book. Uh, it's, a, it's a great resource. It's, it's one of our more popular resources. And I uh, just uh, hope you're able to take advantage of that. Also, uh, we have upcoming webinars. Uh, the feedback that we get from you guys in this webinar and other webinars we've had this year are going to help determine uh, what we're going to talk about next year. We have a lot of exciting content planned. We've already planned a lot of it out, a lot of great themes coming in on what it looks like to rediscover Jesus in 2021. So we're excited to present that to you, and we're going to have some webinars coming out about that. Uh, but they're still they're still pending. They're, they'll be coming soon. But be looking for invitations to those webinars. Uh, I think you're just going to be seeing a lot of great content on what it looks like um, to be a fan of Jesus versus a follower of Jesus in different areas of your life. Uh, and we have a lot of great resources to go along with that as well. And then lastly, we just invite everybody to go out to, to Vantal.org. Uh, blogs, videos, resources, virtual events, uh, live events uh, when we're able to, to hold um, bigger live events in the future. Uh, all those are right there. Go explore the website, uh, explore the store, lots of different tracks and resources available there. Um, things that are gonna help you either be more equipped to share your faith or to get you what you need to share your faith, faith actively. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar and uh, we hope everybody has a very Merry Christmas and a great and productive new year in 2021. And we wish you all the best.